Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Credit Chat Live. I'm Rod Griffin, Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. I'm here to answer your questions about credit reporting and credit scoring and fraud and ID theft as we work through this time with the virus and, and the unprecedented things we're all facing. I think it's important more than ever to, to talk to one another, to share information we have. Uh, so, uh, Matisco14, thanks for joining, and Rich Financial, thanks for being here and being part of the chat. If you have questions about credit reporting or credit scoring, fraud and ID theft, uh, anything related to COVID-19 that's tied to those issues in your credit report, um, feel free to ask. Uh, you know, let me know. I'll do my best to answer. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, and we'll see if we can get it. Uh, Simpson Art, hi. How are you? Good to see you, and thanks for being here. You know, there's a lot going on uh, and a lot changing as we work through this time uh, and through this crisis. So really important, I think, that we talk and that we be connected and experience doing everything we can to make sure that we're available and reaching out and engaging. So important, uh, I think, to, to make sure we have questions. Um, <laughs> Mix, Mau Mau, I don't know if I'm saying that right, zero one. Um, you have $1.2 million to local debt people. I don't want to sell my hotels, which I own in my car. Uh, so if you have debts you owe and it's to an organization, talk to, and I think the same thing applies here. In this case, with hotels, you may be talking about credit, business credit reporting, which would be a different issue. Uh, so check your business credit report. You can get a free business credit report from Experian. If you just go to Experian.com uh, and search our business credit reports, you can find or search for business reports. You'll be able to get a free business credit report. Uh, that will be able to show you what the information is on your hotels, for example, assuming they are registered or you have a business registered to manage those hotels. From a car perspective, uh, and, um, your, your, uh, and your car, that, if that's private uh, and privately owned, that would be a, con a consumer credit report question. I might want to check your personal report, you can get it free once a week at annualcreditreport.com. Know how that's being reported. Talk to your lender about options there. And I think the amount that you owe in debt is less important than the taking advantage of services you have. So whether it's $1.2 million or $1,200, if you're having challenges resulting from COVID ID or COVID ID, COVID-19, think about ID theft and the scams we've been talking about, COVID-19, uh, talk to your lenders. They have tools and resources that are available to help you. Uh, and can assist you through this to protect your credit history uh, and to help you come out of this uh, at least where you, you're starting and be, have a plan forward. So uh, talk to your, it's always important to talk to your lenders, know what's in that report, make sure that you are addressing those issues, really important to do. Uh, Neri Kothari, thanks for joining. Jen on the Rocks underscore one, thanks for being here. A long performer, thanks for joining. Uh, and and Neji, if I'm probably mispronouncing that, but thanks for being here. I apologize. And uh, so far, I'm well. Uh, I'm well. I'm happy. My family's good. So thank you. I hope the same is true for you. Uh, and you know that we're all, you know, we're, we're as they say, we're all in this together, uh, and trying to do the right things to make sure that we're protecting each other as well as ourselves. So it's a, a huge challenge. Uh, so I'm between jobs and haven't been able to make some payments. How long is this going to affect me? So J Nolan 23, again, really important. If you have payments that are due, talk to your lenders, talk to your utility companies, talk to your, uh, if it's an apartment management company or rental, your landlord, talk to them about the services that are available. There are government uh, programs in place around mortgages. There are at federal and state level, there are programs around uh, rent and eviction uh, uh, prohibitions, those sorts of things. So you can take some of that stress away uh, and then get your credit report. Use it to identify who your lenders are and what your accounts are and how to contact them. That will have a contact uh, number, generally a telephone number uh, and maybe an address and, a, and potentially a website. But check that information. Use it to contact your lenders. Tell them what your situation is that if you are affected by COVID-19, there are tools and resources they can provide that under the CARES Act, under federal law, will help protect your credit history and essentially freeze it at the moment that payment, um, what we're calling a payment accommodation, it could be a forbearance, could be a deferment, might be some other uh, agreement you have with your lender. At the moment that's implemented, will help protect your credit history by 
reporting it with the same delinquency rate. So if you're 30 days late, when it's put in place, it would stay 30 days late. If you're current, it would remain current, even though no payments would be due. Uh, and if you catch up, if you have a late payment and you're able to make payments and bring the account current, it would be updated to show current so you could benefit. Uh, but there, your history and your credit score should be protected. So talk to your lenders. First and foremost, know what their, their options are for you and they can help get that credit report. Don't be afraid to know what's in it. And to check it, it won't hurt your credit report. It won't hurt your credit scores in any way to get that report. You can get it once a week, once every seven days at annualcreditreport.com. It's a good place to start. Uh, Leather Jacket, thanks for joining. X420XX, thanks for being here in New York Zeppelin. Thanks for being part of the chat today. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. If you're just joining for the first time, I'm Rod Griffin. I'm Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. This is Credit Chat Live. I try to be here 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We're on Facebook Live on Credit Chat Live and on Crowdcast on Fridays at 11.30 Central, 12.30 Eastern. So join us there. Check out Crowdcast. We're trying to build a community there that will help us answer questions, be more engaging. Uh, and we're simulcasting on Facebook Live as well on Experian's uh, news site and news blog site. So uh, search Experian Facebook, you'll be able to find us as well uh, and uh, join us there. But trying to share information as much as we can. We're also on Twitter on Wednesdays on Credit Chat at 2 o'clock Central, 3 Eastern, having great conversations with experts around what happens with COVID-19, not only with your credit, but with other things like investments and savings and, and other personal finance issues, families, so forth and so on. So really important to have these conversations. Um, Star Bakulos, thanks for joining. Nasienko, Naslenko, I have to look through the bottom of my glasses. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the ravages of age. I have to have reading glasses now. Um, hopefully that's as bad as it gets. Uh, J Nolan 23 thoughts about settlement. You're at 90 days. Uh, and you know, settlement will always be considered negative. It will hurt your scores uh, and your credit history. And it will be, the account would be reported as settled for less than originally agreed. And that's the negative part because you didn't repay the balance in full. That's going to affect scores. Uh, again, you might talk to lenders right now in, in, because even at 90 days late, they may be able to stop those payments in for, and put them in forbearance or deferment so that you don't have any payments due if it's a result of COVID-19 or job loss related to that or income reduction and help you at least maintain your footing until we, you come out of this and get back on, back on a job and maybe be able to catch up. Another thing I would suggest is talk to a good credit counselor uh, and financial counselor. We often refer people to nfcc.org. There are other great ones out there, but the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, they have nonprofit members around the country with people who are objective. They're not going to be judgmental. They're going to be able to look at your overall financial situation, which we can't do, I can't do, but they can look at not only your credit history, but your other assets and sources of income that can work with your lenders uh, with your participation and on your behalf to help address some of the some issues potentially. So that may be a better opportunity. And then at least as a starting point to see what other options are available short of settlement. And then they may have you enter a debt settlement plan or debt management plan, which often is negotiating settlement with your lenders, uh, but be able to work with you there too and help guide through that process. So um, kind of the su suggestion I would have first, uh, if you're looking at debt settlement, make sure you're working with a good company uh, or a good nonprofit, even better generally, uh, if they're just saying, if you pay us X dollars, we'll sell your account, or they sometimes refer to it as debt consolidation, meaning you write one check and then they negotiate settlement with all of your lenders and they distribute that payment. Um, be aware that the cost of that may be more than, than um, the debt itself in some cases. Uh, so be sure you're working with a, a, a good quality company, not saying there aren't good ones out there, but be, be sure you know what your rights are. Be sure you know what you're entering into before you do. Uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And these days with what we're going through, we're starting to hear more and more about really creative scams and schemes. And that's what we're going to talk about Friday on our Crowdcast and our Credit Chat Live on Crowdcast.io and on Facebook Live. So Join us there. It should be a really interesting conversation with me, Christina Roman and, and Jennifer White, who work with me. So, uh, And then anyone else who wants to join in the conversation. So we hope the, you, know, you all will be there as well. Um, so you know, debt settlement will be seen as negative. 
take advantage of the resources that are available now, I think would be step one and get help. Don't be afraid to ask for guidance uh, from somebody who's objective uh, and, and can, can look at your overall situation. Uh, Matisco 14, what helped more the credit score, paying the balance down to 1% or paying the balance in full? Paying the balance in full. It's a simple answer. You do not have to carry a balance from month to month to improve your credit scores. If you leave 1% balance, you only pay 99% of it, you're going to pay interest on that balance to the bank. Uh, so it's going to cost you more money. It's not going to do anything to help your credit scores. What will happen is if you use the credit card during the month and you get your billing statement, it will show a balance. That balance is what's usually reported to the credit reporting company. So if you pay it in full, you'll still see a balance on your credit report in most cases. Uh, so you know, it doesn't help to not pay the balance in full. Paying the balance in full means you don't have a, a debt you're carrying over. You're able to then have uh, you know, a better financial situation and not pay interest or other potential fees that are associated with carrying a balance. And so it will save you money uh, and, and potentially take advantage of things like other incentives for airline miles. Not that we can all fly right now, but airline miles or insurance discounts or purchase discounts at certain stores. You know, Take advantage of those things that help you and then when you pay in full, you don't have to pay interest or other fees. So it saves you money and actually works to your advantage. Use credit as a financial tool. I say this all the time. Debt's the financial problem. Uh, so I don't know where that myth came from. I've heard it for several a number of years now. It pops up. Only pay 99% or only pay 95% uh, of your balance and it will help your scores is absolutely not true. Uh, you can pay your bills in full if you can. And that's with several card companies. Right. And so with each of them, you would pay interest uh, if you carried a balance. So paying full if you can, uh, that's from a credit reporting and scoring perspective, that's the best thing you can do. Uh, eGuzzy6, thanks for joining. Because uh, I read on FICO paying from 1% to 9%. That I don't know, and I don't know why they would give that advice. Um, it's good to keep your balances as low as possible uh, and uh, to because that's going to help your credit scores. If you can pay in full, that's the best uh, because again, if it, on your credit report, it will show the balance. Now, you will not generally see a zero balance on your credit card if you use it. The only way to really have a zero balance reported is if you pay the balance off and then don't use it at all for at least a full month so that then the, the amount due is updated in your credit report as zero or the balance is updated to zero in your credit report and then not use it. Because if you use it and you get your billing statement, that's the balance that will show. You know, so keeping that as low as possible is good. Uh, the balance that you reach in the month, but paying it in full is going to be the best thing you can do from a, a reporting scoring standpoint. Um, so you saw uh, Hungry Belly Boy. I saw Wells Fargo send my late payment history to your credit report. Your, point went down, your score went down like 12 points. So you know, I can't speak to specific lenders. If you have a payment that's due and you miss that payment, by a full billing cycle, so a full 30 days, it would be reported to Experian as 30 days late. So if you're just a day or two late, they generally, they won't report it because they have to miss a full billing cycle. So if you catch up after a couple of days, they might charge late fees, they might increase your interest rate, but that wouldn't be reported to Experian. If your payment is a full 30 days late, for example, if your payment was due today, and then this date next month, you still hadn't paid it. They could report that late payment to Experian. It would be reported 30 days late. That would have a negative effect on your scores. The number of points really depends on your overall credit history, the scoring system that's used, uh, and, and so on, and what you know, the rest of your history looks like. You know, do you have high balances or low balances? Uh, 12 points for a 30-day late is actually very minimal. Um, Surprised it's that low. So there could be something more there. Uh, but check your report. Make sure that's what's happened. It, it, you know, at 12 points, generally that's it would you would see a bigger drop if it's a 30-day late payment, assuming other things are okay and, and doing well. So I'm not sure what happened there. Um, not something to be I, I would be upset about if it just went down 12 points. That's not a bad thing. Uh, it's not good that it went down, but it's not as high as I typically see uh, when you and you see a 30-day late payment. So um, you know, a lot of things at play. So I'm not sure exactly what the, you know, the point change would be for, but check your credit report. It gets free once a week at annualcreditreport.com. So check that out. Uh, Powder Nose, thanks for joining uh, Peter Southern. Thank, Welcome to Periscope and thanks for joining uh, K Credit Repair. Always good to see you. And thanks for joining. Hope you're doing well. 
Um, paid these accounts off months ago. It's like six months ago. Hmm. So it, so it may be that there's, if it were late, it would still be reported late. But if it's paid in full, it could still show, you know, one of the things that might have happened is if you were actually delinquent, meaning you had a 30-day late payment, and then you paid it off, what would usually happen is it, it would show paid in full was 30 days late. So it still shows that history of the, of the payment. So not sure, you know, what happened there. And if it, if it came later, you might dispute it. Uh, if it's been paid in full, dispute it as paid in full, never late. Uh, and they would need to check that. Uh, but it generally, you know, if, if it was paid in full that long ago, if it was already 30 days late, it would still be reported paid was 30 days late. And that 30 days late, 30 to, that late payment would remain for seven years from the date of that late payment. The further in the past it occurred, the less effect it will have. And it was only 12 points. And we all hate to see our scores go up and down. Mine go up and down all the time too. That's kind of natural. So 12 points almost sounds like just a, you know, something aged, something small changed, uh, and, and, or there were a couple of, you know, several inquiries, something like that. You would see that kind of point change. 12 points generally won't cause you to pay lower or higher uh, rates, won't cause you to shift in tier. Uh, and unless you're really close to a tier line or borderline, have other issues. So, um, you know, I'm not sure. And, and so check again, check your score again in you know, a month or so, see if it goes back up because it might bounce back up too. And so I'm not sure. I'm, so I'm just throwing out possibilities. Uh, Tina LaRoe, Christina Roman, good to see you. Um, she works for me, so <laughs> and she will keep me on the straight and narrow and correct me if I say something I shouldn't. Now, how can a credit card keep giving credit to a score of 502? So BC211, if you have a credit card uh, and already have that account open and you're using it well, they probably aren't looking at your credit history or your credit scores if they're thinking about or have given you an increased credit line, for example. that's The credit score is only one factor in that decision. So if you're managing it well, you're doing well with them, they may still say, hey, you're a good risk for us because you're paying on time. You're not overusing that amount. Uh, so it's their decision. In most cases, lenders review their portfolios, the accounts periodically, and will check your credit report, potentially run, you know, they'll calculate a score and determine whether you qualify for a balance increase or pardon me, a credit limit increase or you know, lower interest rates or other incentives and may offer them to you to uh, incentivize you to help to, be, to make charges and to be a good customer for them. So, uh, you know, and to reward you for being a good customer for, customer for them. So check with them uh, You know, on that. I'm not sure, you know, what's happened there and, but they may still do that. Uh, hey, Dar 12, one twenty four. Thanks for joining. Uh, and Mom73, thanks for meeting here. Ms. ZD4, always good to see you. Thanks for joining and, and for being such a great participant in the Credit Chat uh, and our Credit Chat Live programs. Please ask any questions you have. I'll do my very best to answer. If you're just joining, I'm Rod Griffin. I'm Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. And this is Credit Chat Live. I'm here Tuesdays and Thursdays, or at least try to be, uh, 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern, and we're live on Facebook Live and on Crowdcast.io on Fridays, 11.30 Central, 12.30 Eastern as well, uh, sharing information and answering any questions you might come to us with us. So join us there. We'd love to see you. Uh, we're just starting to use Crowdcast.io. I want to build a community there uh, and really be able to share more. And so check it out. We're, we're trying to learn more about it as well. So we'd love to see you there. We want to do some polls and do some other things to be more engaging and to get more feedback too. So we're, if, if you can do that, please do. We'd, we'd love to see it. Um, and that's on Fridays, 11.30 Central, 12.30 Eastern. Uh, Coach Reed, thanks for joining. Uh, you know, things are really changing, uh, as we all know, uh, and I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all, you are all well and safe. Uh, and in, in some places, we're starting to have uh, a lesser requirements. So we're starting to open up the economy a bit. I hope some of you are able to get back to work soon. Um, I got my hair cut. I was the first one in line, I think maybe the second. Uh, I'm in Texas. And so, you know, it's a whole process. You still wear a mask. You still wait outside. They wave you in when it's empty and disinfected and they do all of that. So, um, but I was so glad to get my hair cut. It's funny how the little things like that make such a difference. Uh, BC211, nephew has that 502 score, never makes payments a 
applied new credit place and they gave it to him. Okay, so a BC211. So they may apply, he may have, probably not the kind of credit he wants. Uh, my guess is, so, you know, and so he applies for credit. I'm assuming it was a credit card, maybe not. Did he get credit at a couple of, several things come to mind? One, if he got an account, it's probably very high interest rate, probably high fees and requirements. Uh, so not the most desirable kind of credit. Did he apply for, you know, buy here, pay here credit? Did he apply for something like a payday loan? Is it the kind of usury thing? Those sorts of things it may not be and probably isn't the kind of credit a person would want. And at a 502, you're right. He you probably would not be approved. Almost certainly would not be approved for most kinds of credit. So I suspect it is a place that doesn't check credit reports or credit histories. Is probably charging very high interest rates, high fees, may have high penalties. It could be a payday loan. It could be a title loan where you give someone the title to your car. If you don't pay it, they take your car away. You know, things like that that are really high risk. Uh, and so uh, to use a consumer at high cost and predatory. So would need to know more about the exact thing they, that he applied for and was approved for and how much it was. It would tell a lot about exactly what happened. If they're checking credit reports and credit scores, that's actually, I read a story the other day from a, a news uh, organization that said one of the ways to know you're working with a legitimate lender is they check your report and score because they're trying to manage their risk. And it also shows that they have complied with federal law around verifying the ability to repay and protecting, if it's a bank, for example, their customers from loss because they're actually loaning your money when they loan it to somebody else from your deposits. So it's uh, one of those things that helps protect them and shows that they're doing their due diligence. So really an important thing to understand uh, and part of why credit reports are so important. How's the score of 660? It, just a little below average. Uh, the average Vantage score today is 685, if I remember correctly. I haven't looked for a little while. The average FICO score was just above 700. So 660 is a little bit below average, moving in the right direction. If you're trying to build your scores and improve them over time, one, get your report. And two, get your credit scores. Three, get the factors that go with that score, what we call risk factors. They're the things that tell you what from your credit report most affected the score you receive. Focus on those risk factors. They will help you take the right steps to improve your credit scores over time. Really important to focus on the factors, less than the number, in fact. Number's important, but as you build it and address those factors, it's going to help your scores over time. So work on those risk factors. Use them to improve your scores over time. Your scores will get better. Also consider Experian Boost if you haven't done that. If you go to experian.com slash boost, you can learn more about how to have your positive cell phone payments and your positive utility payments, things like natural gas, water, and electricity added to your credit report. It's a free service. It's with your choice and your permission, so you can change your mind if you don't want to. Uh, but it gives us permission to capture your payment each month from the bank account you pay it from. Put that in your report as an account, as a positive entry to help boost your credit scores. On average, we're seeing scores for people with scores below 680 and with thin files increase an average of about 19 points. And people with, on general, two out of three people see an average of about 13 points. So you might see some increase. We give you a FICO 8 score at the beginning. We give you another FICO 8 score after you've enrolled so that you can see the impact right away. So it's instant. Check that out. It might be helpful. Besides deferring payments, okay, credit repair. Okay, you always ask me good questions. Besides deferring payments and accounts, what's something else consumers can do to protect their credit? Right now, it's talk with your lenders. Some lenders are offering things like reduced interest pay, uh, rates or lower payments over an extended period of time. So they there are options there. Uh, we were what the CARES Act refers to and what we are, are looking at are payment accommodations. So it could be forbearance, it could be deferment, it could be some other agreement you have with the lender. When you have that agreement as a result of COVID-19, we will 
effectively freeze the account. So if you are current when that forbearance or deferment or other payment accommodation is entered into, it will remain current. When that forbearance period ends or that payment accommodation ends, it starts over with you as current. It doesn't become delinquent. If you are 30 days late when that period starts, you will be 30 days late when it ends and just pick up right where you left off. It won't become more delinquent or more late. If you bring those accounts current during that time, we would update the account to show it's current so it can be, become more positive, but wouldn't hurt your scores or wouldn't affect them negatively. So we won't add more negative information. Um, so you know, it just depends on the lender and their options they're offering. We will report it as I reported to us. Grogger, I got sucked into freedom debt relief. Everything paid in full now. How do I fix besides waiting the seven years? And, you know, it depends on how long ago it occurred. There's several things that will work to your advantage that might be helpful. When you pay a collection account and it's reported as paid in full, if you have collection accounts that are reported as paid in full, the newest scores will exclude them from the calculation. So having the paid collection might actually help your scores, assuming that's what happened. If you settled your accounts, they're going to be reported as settled. That's going to have a negative impact, but it can, it's relative to your overall credit history. So if you have otherwise had a very strong credit history, um, or pardon me, if you've, you've had, let me back up. If you've had issues with your credit history, your scores are already low. That may not be the worst thing. Your scores may not drop that much or may it may not really have a real effect. If you were unable to qualify before, getting those accounts settled, getting those payments taken care of so that you can get back on your feet, begin to re regain control of your personal finances and start to rebuild, that can actually work to your advantage. Uh, so it may not be a bad thing necessarily. It will take time for your scores to improve. The further in the past that the accounts were settled, assuming that's what happened, the less effect they will have on your scores and on your credit worthiness. Won't, even, so even though they're on the report for seven years, five or six down year, years down the road, they, may have, they will have less and less effect. So don't give up. Your scores will get better over time. Take advantage of Experian Boost. Like I just mentioned, mentioned, that might be helpful for you. Check that out. Use the tools that are available to you. And in time, you will be able to rehabilitate re, 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 and improve your score so, and improve your credit history. So don't give up. <laughs> Melancholy rain. Can I, can I just visit the dark web and exploit the credit system? Probably not and not do so legally. Uh, and by the way, Experian, if you're a part of our monitoring service, we monitor for people using the, the dark web to commit identity theft and others. So we would alert. You, if you were a member of our monitoring service, to someone who was doing what you're suggesting. So, uh, you know, be aware of that uh, and the legal repercussions. Uh, and generally, if you're in the dark web, it's a place that's called the dark web for a reason. Not the best place to be, generally. Uh, and I don't even know how to get there. Don't don't care to. Uh, there's there's negative information affecting your FICO score. Simpson Art. There's negative information affecting your FICO score that is not on any of your credit reports. That can't be the case. There are, if, if let me put it this way, FICO scores, FICO creates algorithms, models, formulas, all terms of the same thing, that pull credit report information into them to calculate a credit score. If they're only using credit report information, which pure, FICO, uh, pure credit scores do, Vantage Score, FICO, and others, then... Uh, if it's not in the credit report, it's not affecting the score. That said, lenders may have other kinds of systems and review programs and scoring systems that look at information from other sources. Those can be affected by other information. If you're looking at background checks, for example, they may be pulling information from other public records that would affect your ability to qualify for a position or uh, some uh, some agreement, security clearance, those sorts of things that don't involve a credit report at all. So it's possible that they're looking at something that's not from a credit report. Mortgage loans often incorporate information in addition to your credit report, previous mortgages, other kinds of uh, relationships you might have that could affect a mortgage score that's not part of a credit report. 
So in those cases, it's possible. But generally speaking, with credit scores, they're looking at the information from your credit report. And if it's not in the credit report, it's not going to affect the score. What's important to know is that if you apply for a service and they use a credit report or a credit score and you're declined, you do not get the best terms, they must provide what we call a declination notice or an adverse action notice that explains why you were declined, that if they use a score, provides the score they used, an explanation of that score, if there's a credit report, free access to the credit report and the company they used, so you can get that information, should be able to see exactly why or why not uh, you were approved or declined, uh, or declined and didn't get the best rates, pardon me. I will tell you this, I applied for a car years ago, right out of, got my first job, went to buy a car, I got declined. And the declination letter said, first line was, you've not been at your job long enough. It had nothing to do with my credit history, had nothing to do with my finances. It had to do with the fact that I was young and hadn't been working long enough to know if I was going to keep that job. And the lender decided that posed too much risk and they declined my application. I was able to work with another lender who approved it and still got my car. But there are reasons beyond a credit report. That's just one of the factors and credit scores are just one of the factors in those decisions. So important to understand that and be aware of that. Is there forgiveness possibility by creditors? Uh, hungry belly boy, potentially. Uh, you need to talk to your lender. They may be able to. Certainly now with everything that's happening, there are upper options for payment accommodations or reduced payments, those sorts of things to help you through a difficult time if you're affected by the virus, now, whether it's job loss or job redu income reduction, those sorts of things. Really depends on the lender as to whether or not they would forgive a debt. That's up to them. It's a decision they would have to make. That works, the monitoring system. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Ms. Ms. Precious74. Uh, hungry belly boy for late history if you dispute it. Uh, so if you dispute something as inaccurate, we will go to the source and they would then be required to verify or well, to verify that either it remains as reported, that it should be updated in some way. So they may say, no, it's not 30 days late. No, or they might say, no, it's not 60 days late. It's 30 days late. They might tell us to change something or remove it from your report. So you can always dispute. It's always free. It doesn't affect credit scores in any way. So if you feel something's inaccurate, you should absolutely dispute that information and you know see what, what happens. They, they may say, yeah, it shouldn't be reported that way. Beth Hoover Fitness, thanks for joining. Any updates with FICO 10? Not yet. Uh, and I think with all of the things that are happening now, it's probably going to take even longer for it to be adopted. Or And it's still early, early for that scoring system. You know, we talk about this quite often. FICO and Vantage Score and other scoring companies regularly update their scoring models. It's just part of studying the trends and the behaviors in the marketplace of consumers. And they're making changes to their algorithms to reflect those changes. FICO 10 is just a natural evolution of previous scores. I don't think you will see huge changes for the vast majority of people. And you're going to stay pretty much the same. If you are you know, kind of on the edges, you have lower scores, you might see some increases. You, uh, you probably won't go any lower. If you're on the very higher end, you might see some decreases, but aren't going to drop a whole lot. I just don't see that happening. It wouldn't make sense for FICO to create a score that says you have great scores on our on FICO 8 or FICO 9, but on FICO 10, you're terrible. Wouldn't make any sense at all. Uh, and so I don't think you'll see those kinds of shifts or those kinds of changes. What I think you will see, and with FICO 10T, for example, that trended data, you might actually see more people be able to qualify than could before because it's looking at behavior over time. You know, I'm, I'm looking for the positive things that could happen as a result, not, you know, not, and that, because what we want to do is be able to identify what FICO wants to be able to do is identify people who should qualify, but who previously could not to help lenders obtain customers. They don't want to lose customers. Uh, so it's important that, you know, it, it, with credit reporting and scoring, our whole goal is to help people connect with businesses and to help people get the financial services they need. You know, if everybody was told, no, we wouldn't be in business because it wouldn't make sense and, and we wouldn't be facilitating business. Uh, and although I hear that, so you want to make you want lenders to tell me, no, absolutely not. We want them to tell you yes. And they want to tell you yes, because we just want to make sure that 
we're helping them make risk decisions. So some people should be told no because they can't make those payments and couldn't manage the debt. And it would be bad for them as well as for the bank. But you know, if there are people who are previously unable to qualify, but because of changes in the marketplace and, and our ability to look at information that's now available and say, look, we just couldn't identify them as a good risk before, but they are, that's fantastic. I mean, that's going to help people. And I think that's going to be good. It says I have a delinquent account and four accounts paid late, which never, ever happened. Then you should absolutely dispute that information. If you have documentation, billing statements, those sorts of things, you can upload them, send them, we'll send them with the dispute. Uh, so that the lender gets them and we should be able to address those issues. If you disagree with the results of the dispute, add what we call a statement of dispute to your credit report. It says, I disagree and here's why. So it lets you tell your side of the story. It can be very important if you're applying for, for loans. Mortgages will always notify the lenders that there's a statement on file and would be there for them to see and help you tell your side of the story. Ryan back 6246 six two six four three eight four one thanks for joining howard new york city money doesn't make sense anymore it's i'm not sure how you what you mean by that exactly <laughs> it could be money in general or just personal finance and how we manage because we are in a, in a really chaotic time and it's difficult to know what to do or how to manage your finances uh, and i you know, understand that uh, you know, we, my family talks about this all the time too. And, and, you know, I have daughters and grandkids and it's always kind of a struggle of what do we do and how do we invest and how do we save and how do we use credit? Well, and that's what we want to help. Uh, it does a, it, so I understand what you're saying. Uh, great girl, five, five, five. Thanks for joining BC to 11. Does a perfect score ever exist? Yes, uh, sort of. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are lots and lots of credit scores and they have different scales most commonly today, scores are 300 or 350 to 850, but there are different scales. So FICO, best known, probably the most recognized name in scoring, is about 300 to about 850 for their what we call generic score. So FICO 8, you know, uh, for example, the most commonly used score. Vantage score is their largest competitor. There's, their current scoring systems go to 850 as well. So that would be the supposed perfect score. You can hit that score. I've done it a couple of times, uh, but it never stays that way. And so it's there. You look at the right time and you see at 850 and go, yay. And then you look you know, next month and it's back down 10 or 20 points. So it just depends on what's happening with your credit history, what your balances are, what's going on. It's possible. Uh, I also have, you know, with my, as an employee of Experian, I have, my perk is a membership to our, our premier monitoring service. So we get multiple credit scores from FICO. There is a FICO auto score that goes to 900. So I actually have a credit score that's 870 something at the moment. It's not perfect, but it's above 850. So, you know, I always tell people, I don't worry so much about the scores. I take care of my credit report. If I take care of my credit report, the scores will take care of themselves. Uh, and, you know, if we want to have a bar bet about who has the best scores, I'll win every time because I'll find one where I have a score that's really good uh, and higher on a different scale, whatever it might be. Uh, so, uh, you know, don't worry so much about the number, except to know what gives you an idea of where you stand in terms of risk and that it reflects the information in the credit report. If you're going to apply for a loan, certainly good to know where you are. Uh, don't chase the perfect score. I just, I don't, uh, because I would have more gray hair than I already do. And I have plenty of that. Uh, so, you know, I, I worry about and take care of my credit report, make sure my payments are on time, make sure my balances are low. I only apply for credit when I need it. Do all those common sense things. And you'll have scores that are good enough to get the credit you need when you need it at the rates you want to pay. That's a perfect credit score, not the number itself. And that's what's so important. You want to be able to have a score that's good enough to get the best terms and the best rates available. That's not an 850. An 850 certainly would, but if you're 750, 760 and above, you're probably going to get the best rates anyway. And you're doing the right things. It's just a matter of time and circumstance, you know, what's happening at a, a given moment where your scores might improve some more. The higher your scores are, the harder it is to get there. And mine go up and down all the time too. So yeah, I don't worry about the score so much. Uh, it's, it's fun to look. Here's another tidbit. My wife's scores are usually better than mine. So uh, I try not to look <laughs> and look at hers at the same time. Now, women's scores on average are better than men's. Most people don't know that. 
but women tend to have better scores than men. And so we have some work to do, guys. Can a charge-off account by Capital One, and I can't speak to a specific lender, it's not on a credit report for almost four years, affect your, your credit history? No. Uh, you know, If it's not on the report, it's not affecting credit scores. So if it's gone, it's gone. If a charge-off account's fallen off, they might still be able to try to collect for it, but it will not be on the credit report if it's beyond the seven-year date from the original delinquency date. Come off the report. Um, people making minimum wage and leasing $50,000 cars, I know that's a mystery to me too. Don't know how they do that um, or why they would do that. Don't have a good answer for that one, I agree. Uh, so uh, I have an 819 score with TransUnion, 703 with Experian. It kind of does. Uh, it's just that there, one, you may be looking at different scores. Uh, so make sure you're getting a score from the same source and it's the same score. So is it a FICO score? Is it a FICO 8 score? Is it a FICO 9 score? Is it a FICO auto score? You know, make sure you're looking at exactly the same model. When you get those scores, you're looking at different credit history. So one from Experian might be different from one from TransUnion. We may have additional information. Our information may be more up to date uh, than our competitor. There may be accounts reported to Experian that are not reported to our competitor so there are differences in that information. The other thing to understand is that with FICO scores, for example, their, their coding, their programming to work with TransUnion because of their databases and the way their computers work, it can be a little different than it is with Experian, and that can introduce some score difference. You know, so you know, there's something missing. That is, granted, a fairly large difference. But I can tell you, I get my scores from five or six different places, just like you would or anybody else about once a year. And I typically see a score range of 150 points difference. And it just depends on the scoring system that's used, the scale in that system, the credit report that's being used. The thing to look at is what does that particular score say in the report you got with it about what it means? What does it say? Usually they will both say excellent or good or They'll mean the same things in terms of risk. That's what's important. So don't try to compare one number to another. They'll almost never match uh, because they're different scores or different scales or different credit reports from different sources at different times, potentially different information. So it's, you, it's hard to compare number to number. Instead, compare what that number represents to what the other number represents. And you'll find that they're almost always the same in that sense. You're a great risk. They're both going to show you a great risk, even though the numbers can be different. Uh, can I get extra credit? Uh, probably not for me. <laughs> I was never the curve breaker in school. How long do I have to wait after late payments in order to start seeing FICO scores improve? So three months, three to six months, if you if you become current, brought the accounts current after the late payments, yeah, give at least a billing cycle, which is 30 days at a minimum, usually two to three months, maybe more for you to start seeing those improvements uh, over time. And the further in the past they, they were, the less effect they'll have. The change in your scores will also be related to your overall credit history. So what are the other issues in your credit history? Do you have other late payments, collection accounts, charge-offs, bankruptcy, or is it you, know, you had one or two late payments and everything else is fine? That will be a completely different result over time and probably faster. So look at that as well. Will be lenders be able to deferred status or affected by natural disaster once the account is something? Will they be able to see it or not? They would not. It would it would just simply be back in repayment status. So it wouldn't continue to affect your credit history. The, so the payment status would change to show current active or in, in repayment status. It indicates in repayment rather than forbearance or deferred. Do I think sometime in the future U.S. will be cashless? Uh, maybe uh, large, you know, I, potential. I think it's a long time away. You, you and your wife have a competition that has the highest credit score. The loser has to pay for dinner. That's not a bad deal. Somehow, though, I always ended up paying for dinner, even when my score was better. Never could figure that out. But, so that's an issue. Unfortunately, we can't. If you get your credit report, we'll have a toll free number. You can speak to one of our representatives. I can't take calls directly. So, wise Al 19, sorry about that. And a late payment stays for seven years from the original delinquency date of the original debt. Matisco 14 is Experian FICO score the most accurate score. We like to think that our credit report is the most accurate, complete, thorough credit report. We believe that, which would then result in the FICO is calculating a score 
that would have the most accurate score. That's my perspective, slightly biased because I work for them. Uh, and if you're just joining, I'm Rod Griffin, Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. We ran a bit long today, but happy to. I love having the questions in the conversation. Obviously, I think this is one of the best things we can do is to share information you need. And so thanks for being here. This Diners Club carte blanche still around? I don't know. I haven't seen it for a long time. Diners Club was the very first credit card you know, back in the late 50s or 60s, I believe. And so, But I know Diners Club is still around. I'm not sure if if the card is. I'm, I'm almost certain they are. How many points can I expect if, my, if I pay my credit card to be under 30% utilization? Uh, Kenny Hudson, here's the answer to every credit question I can answer. It depends. So it depends on your credit history. It depends on your overall uh, payment history over time. If every account's current, paid on time, you reduce those balances. The lower the balances on your credit cards as compared to the limits, the better. That 30% number doesn't mean that, that having a balance won't be negatively affecting your scores. It just means that when you cross that threshold, what they've shown and studied is that when a person has a utilization rate of greater than 30%, the likelihood they will default begins to increase rapidly. And so your scores drop faster once you cross that 30% utilization rate. So keeping your balances below will help minimize the negative impact. The lower, the better. So if you can pay them in full, that's even better. That's very, be the best thing you can do. The lower you keep those balances, the better. If I request a limit increase, will it count as a hard inquiry? That's another great question. It depends on how they go about it. Some lenders will offer a credit limit increase without even looking at your credit report. If you've had a great history with them, been a longtime customer, always paid on time, keep your balances lower paid, they may say, sure, we'll be happy to increase your limit and just do it automatically. Some may do a soft inquiry, depending on their internal processes. Others may say, well, you'll need essentially to apply for that increase and could treat it as hard inquiry. So it depends on how the lender approaches it. Uh, I've seen all three happen. So it just it depends on their approach. Love your Experian app. Thank you so much, Indy Joe 2112. Uh, and visit, you go to our Experian app. If you search in the Play Store, the App Store, you will be able to find the Experian app. It's a free app. We provide a free report once a month. You also get a free FICO 8 score, so you'll know where you are. Check that out. Uh, thanks for the, for the plug. Always good to see that. 0% of cars, amazing feeling. Awesome. And good for you. Uh, I have a question. Why do credit bureaus drop your score 30 points for a negative, but only raise it 12 for a positive? Well, it's not us, for one. We don't raise or lower scores. We collect the information about your payment history and store it in the credit report. Scoring companies like FICO and Vantage Score, lenders create their own formulas. They pull that information in and they determine what it means to them. The kind of best analogy I can give is that you know, for that change and is think about someone you been friends with and had a great relationship with and they break your trust you have an agreement with them they don't follow through they're not true to their word and then you start to rebuild that relationship they lose trust a lot faster than they can rebuild it in a very very basic way that's what that's saying it's like way well, you were late we want to make sure everything's okay your catch up we're good we're starting again a few months you'll see that score start to rebuild but it's harder to rebuild that score than it is to have it go down. So that's why it's so important. Continue to make your payments on time every single time. Make sure you catch up on any late payments. The further in the past they occurred, the less effect they have. So that's a question. Jimmy T, last question. Uh, is there, well, one more, because uh, I love this question too. Is there a summit with you and the two other major credit bureaus, like a retreat type of thing? Indy Joe 2112, there's not, but that is a cool idea. We can't do a retreat right now, but obviously we can't everybody get together, but that would be a really cool idea. Uh, so sort of a you know, credit reporting fundamentals, uh, you know, uh, two days with us to learn how to manage your credit report. That would be really cool. Um, something we'll have to think about. A, real good, a really good FICO score. 750, 760 is what we consider super prime. 700 is good. 680 and up, uh, so good place to start. And I've been working for two years on your credit. No repos, no bankruptcy, just a few late years ago. Still can't get 700. Give it time, you'll get there. It's, it, it will improve. 
Uh, it's just keep doing the right things. Pay your bills on time. I know it's boring to hear me say this, but I said the other day to a reporter, and I'm probably going to regret it, and I'll say it again. The, a, a person who is dull, boring, and consistent is the sexiest person alive for a lender. And it's just continue to make those payments on time every single time, doing the same dull, boring stuff. So really, that's what it takes. And it's just time and and doing those things over time. Why does your score keep changing when your circumstances aren't? And it's, again, time is a factor. My scores go up and down all the time, depending on if I use a car to make a purchase and now there's a higher balance and then it goes down again. If I open an account or a close account, if I apply for something or pay it off. So they, they change all the time, usually not very much, you know, 10, 12 points and then either way. Uh, so you'll see that and they tend to climb over time if you're, if you're making those payments on time and doing responsible things. So really important. Uh, I'm 42, not getting any younger. I know how that feels. I'm 52 and I'm still not getting any younger. I don't know when that changes. Um, and it just keeps coming. Sorry, no good news there. Uh, sometimes credit bureaus are viewed as a secret society and they shouldn't be. I and mean, that's why we're here. I mean, and that, and that's why I'm here. Uh, so this is a great question to end on today. I, you know, I, your credit report should not be a mystery. You should know what's in it. It's very transparent. You can get a free copy now once a week at annualcreditreport.com. Know what's in that report. Don't be afraid to work with us. Don't be afraid to join conversations like this. Always important for us to share, to help you learn, but it shouldn't be seen as a secret. Everybody has a role to play. Lenders report information. We collect and store that information. You are deciding how to use credit and how to manage the credit you have and can help us make sure that the information we're reporting is accurate and complete as well. So we all need to play a part. We want to help you connect with lenders and other businesses. We don't want to be a barrier and we don't want it to be a secret. That's why I'm here. That's why I have my job. So I'm very thankful for that. My responsibility is to help people understand how to connect to us. So Awesome. Uh, Kenny Edson, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad to hear a boost. Let's end there. I keep trying to end. i um, gone almost an hour today. So thank you all for the fantastic questions. A great conversation. If you're just joining, I'm signing off. I'm Rod Griffin. I'm Senior Director, Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. This is Credit Chat Live. I'm here or try to be Tuesdays and Thursdays, 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern, usually for only about 30 minutes, but we went along today. We're on Credit Chat on Twitter on Wednesdays, 2 o'clock Central, 3 Eastern. Join us there. You can learn more about Credit Chat Live, Periscope, and our Crowdcast.io and Facebook Live programs at at ex.pn slash Credit Chat Live and about our Twitter programs, our Credit Chat programs at ex.pn slash Credit Chat. And we are posting videos to YouTube. If you search Experience News Blog, you can find uh, some of our YouTube videos as well in our other video programs. So thank you so much for being part of the chat today for all the fantastic questions. Hope you all stay well, stay safe, and we'll talk again very soon. Take care.